Today we are talking about my first paper. Your first academic paper. Yeah, not precisely the first one. Not the first one I ever had my name on,、uh, but the first one that I had my name first on, which meant it was mine. So name first does matter, does it? It does. Yeah, different disciplines have different conventions, but in astronomy, the first author. Is the person who sort of takes responsibility for the paper and also gets a little bit more of the credit. So in this case, this was the first paper that came out of my PhD. So it was important that this was my intellectual work because it was part of the training that I was doing to get my PhD. It is infrared observations of gravitational lensing in Abel 2219 with Circe. And I wouldn't have been able to tell you that without reading. <laughs> It's been a while. <laughs> It was published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, which is where I publish most of my papers. Even now, it's the professional body for astronomers in the UK, but it's read and people publish in it from around the world. So I was newly arrived in the UK. I'd come from Canada. I was experiencing an awful lot of culture shock. An awful lot of imposter syndrome because I was at Cambridge, surrounded by absolutely brilliant individuals. But I was also really excited because I had come to do a PhD in astronomy at one of the best places in the world, and I was getting to work on a topic that I was really interested in, and that was gravitational lensing. And the idea was that we were going to use this brand new instrument with new capabilities that hadn't been used before to. Do something in a way that people hadn't been able to do before, and that was equal parts exciting and anxiety-inducing、um, and nerve-wracking because it involved new instrumentation, and that carried with it some risk. And when you're on a short PhD, and I had three years of funding at the time, that risk made things a little bit nerve-wracking. Everything was riding. On one trip to La Palma in the Canary Islands, four nights in June, to get this camera working, gather the data, and then bring it back and actually get some results from it. And which telescope did you get time on?、Uh, it was the William Herschel telescope, and it has a 4.2 meter diameter primary mirror. At the time, it was sort of a medium to big telescope. Now it's a medium to small telescope as we've built bigger and bigger. Facilities, but it's still going, and it still has a niche in performing large surveys of the sky even today. And what was the camera or instrument that was bolted onto it for your use? This was Circe. This was the Cambridge Infrared Survey Instrument. It was actually built by the instrumentation group at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge, where I was. It was literally being constructed down the hall, or at least in the next building. And a whole group of us went out to La Palma together. The instrument went out ahead of us, along with some people to to set it up and attach it to the telescope. And then it was sort of all hands on deck for this first observing run, to see how it worked when we actually pointed it up at the sky on the telescope. The goal of my project, together with my supervisor, was to measure the masses of galaxy clusters. So I still work on galaxy clusters today. This is where it all started. And the whole point was to use a new instrument. To make observations in a new way, to try out a new technique, to get the masses of galaxy clusters. So the technique was gravitational lensing. Now we've talked about gravitational lensing before, oftentimes in the context of these really spectacular images where you see giant distorted arcs as light passes through massive objects and gets bent and distorted.、It、can also be measured in the weak field, where you just measure statistically these weak distortions. But that's not what we were doing. The idea here is that we were looking at a galaxy cluster, and we were looking for the absence of galaxies or a depletion of galaxies around that cluster due to the sort of distortion of space-time.、And、this is called the depletion effect or the magnification effect, and it's different from that distortion, that shear effect I mentioned earlier, because that measures sort of the change in the gravitational field. As you move across an image, what that's not sensitive to is if you have a nice smooth sheet of mass. So at the time, this was called the mass sheet degeneracy. But if you just use this shear technique, you might not be getting the whole picture. There might be an additive effect. And so this other technique of counting was sensitive to that and would break that mass sheet degeneracy. Now the second important point was that we were doing it in the infrared. And this was what was new about this instrument. 
Circe. It was a wide field camera, so for the first time it was using these new detectors, four of them, that allowed us to capture a large region of sky at one time, and it was working in the near infrared, so redder than optical wavelengths. And that had the advantages specifically for this technique that this depletion effect would be maximized. This comes down to two competing things. First of all, the mass of this galaxy cluster is magnifying objects behind it. That's a fundamental thing about gravitational lensing, makes it a really useful tool. So we're seeing more, we should see more galaxies than we expect because they're being magnified and they're coming into view. But at the same time, the space around it is being stretched and magnetized. So you're, you're, you're spreading them out, you're diluting the number of galaxies. So there's these two things that are countering each other, bringing more galaxies into view, but spreading them out further. And so in the infrared, we expected the spreading to win so that we'd get fewer galaxies seen behind the cluster. And so we used this camera, we chose Abel 2219 as our guinea pig, and we tried the experiment. Did things work out the way you expected then? No, of course things didn't work out the way <laughs> we expected. <laughs> um, you know, the, the instrument had some quirks, the weather wasn't great, I, I seem to remember there was a dust storm coming in from the Sahara, you know, of course things didn't work. Um, so we went back again a year later, we applied for more time. This is where three years doesn't start to seem like a very long time, Brady, when you're under pressure. And so really the, the data came out the second year that we ended up using. The first year was incredibly important in understanding the instrument, getting it working. It was the second year's data that, that went into this paper. Essentially, after analysis, we found a tentative signal that as expected, there were fewer galaxies behind the cluster. So we did see the signal that we expected. We did model that to get the mass of the cluster out, which was the ultimate aim. And essentially we put a marker down for this is how well this technique does or does not work, which then feeds into the rest of the community so that they can make decisions about what research priorities are, are there going forward. And what was the mass of the cluster? So it had a velocity dispersion we modeled of 800 kilometers per second. We didn't weigh the cluster in kilograms because we couldn't do that. We had to infer a, a mass from a model. And the way we model this is through a very simple physical model of a very simple spherical nice cluster that it almost certainly isn't. And that model had a single parameter which was related to the mass. It's called the velocity dispersion that just explains how fast the galaxies are moving around each other or the dark matter particles due to the gravity. So the bigger the cluster, the more range and velocities you'll see. And so velocity to dispersion of 800 kilometers per second, that's a pretty hefty cluster, not the most massive in the universe, but a, a, a good size massive cluster. Professor, I've asked you to get this paper after all these years. When you read it, does it read just the same as all papers? Is this sufficiently pro forma now that it just reads like a normal paper? Or do you feel a bit cringy and think, oh, I was so young and naive then? Like, what do you feel when you look at this now? Oh, I wouldn't feel cringy. I think it stands up, but that's, that's because I didn't write it on my own. There are other names here. My PhD supervisor was second, contributed absolutely to the writing of the paper. And there, you know, that, that's very stringent quality control. So it wouldn't even have been submitted if it wasn't up to scratch. This is the nice finished product, right? This is, this is the end result. But this is, you know, this is where it started. That's the dirt. Yeah, so <laughs> you know me, I don't throw anything away. So I pulled out this file. Look, Ooh. we haven't had stickers. I oh, don't know wow. where the stickers came from. But this sort of, you know, traces the, the history of it. So there's code here, there are notes, there are scribbled <clears throat> notes. <laughs> you know, there's a first image, which is pretty ropey. This is the actual observing log, you know, used to be done on paper. This was in La Palma. These were the observers that were there. I was one among a team of many. And this is what we would record. So the time, 
the frame, what we were doing. And you can see these are all very technical sort of calibration observations. So it's only later on that we actually started looking at astronomical objects. Abel 1689, which is a cluster we didn't use. Um, M13, which we've made videos on before. Messier! You, yeah, in the comments, you can see that we were learning as we were going along, that information was wrong or missing, that we were, we were having problems with focus or we were testing the focus. This was all about getting to know how the instrument worked when it was actually on the telescope. That is amazing to say, it's great. Yeah, so that was one aspect of it. Um, and then, I just don't even know what these things are. <laughs> Emails and code and plots and notes. So this is the messy bits of research. What are those tapes? These tapes? Well, this is how we brought our data home back in the old days, Brady. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some tapes at home, don't yeah, worry. Yeah. This actually reflected that the data was so big that at the time, the computers I was using to process it didn't have enough storage to hold you know, like a gigabyte of data. So I had to keep putting it on tapes just to store it. Can I see the tape? Yeah. Wow. I had a very generous scholarship that brought me to Cambridge, paid my fees, paid my living expenses, but it didn't pay any fieldwork expenses. So at the time, I wasn't sure how I was going to fund my way to go on this observing trip at, uh, at all. Um, so I looked around for any funding sources I could find that would support PhD students. Um, and I can't even remember why, but someone suggested that I write to the Worshipful Company of Scientific Instrument Makers. So this is a, 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 a guild, a professional guild here in the UK of quite obviously scientific instrument makers. So I wrote to them and I said, please, do you have any funding stream that I could apply for? I'd be happy to submit an application, give you a report, whatever, whatever you need. And so they wrote back, and I kept the letter because I, I just love it so much. They wrote back a lovely letter accompanied by a check for 200 pounds, which at the time went a long way to getting me to where I needed to go. And I have always been struck by the generosity, um, uh, the unexpected generosity uh, reflected here. I did write to say thank you. I did update them uh, as to where, uh, what happened on the observing trip. But I'll, I'll record my thanks once again officially to the Worshipful Company of Scientific Instrument Makers for helping getting, getting my PhD started. And thankfully, I acknowledged them in the paper as well. So I uh, was very grateful for their support. As a young astronomer, what was it like when you submitted this paper, you got told it was going to get published? Like, what does that feel like? Uh, pride, relief. I had one brick in the wall of my thesis accomplished, um, you know, after, after some uncertain years. You know, I had learned a lot through the whole journey about how to structure a project. Um, an appreciation for how much went into making an instrument work from, from scratch. Um, and just, just how, you know, uncertain the whole process is, which is why we always have to have multiple lines of research going at any one time, because we don't know when the weather is going to, you know, scupper things on a particular night or a volcano is going to stop us accessing our telescope, or an earthquake, or a global pandemic. You know, being a scientist really is about being adaptable and, and being resilient and being creative, um, because things will almost inevitably not go the way you think they're going to go. So, Ray, one of the reasons I think it's really nice that we're filming this right now is there's a pleasing symmetry around this long-forgotten paper, because I wrote this when I was uh, an uh, excited new PhD student anxiously awaiting the delivery of a brand new wide field instrument on the William Herschel telescope that was going to give us new capabilities that we hadn't had before. And here 25 years later, I'm now a professor and I have my own PhD students who are anxiously and excitedly awaiting the commissioning of a brand new wide field instrument on the William Herschel telescope that's going to give us entirely new ways of pursuing our science. So this is a little bit of a hat tip to the instrument builders out there because I'm a user of telescopes of scientific instruments, but so much effort goes in 
before that by the project scientists, by the engineers, by the technical team, the observatory staff. And I've seen it. I've seen, even on this instrument, what goes on. So we are weeks away from first light on this new instrument called Weave. Weave is the William Herschel Enhanced Velocity Explorer. Okay. Yeah, I'm missing an A. You're missing it, yeah? Is it, I, I, I'm not going to go <laughs> there, It's on the screen. That's what, that's what it stands for. That's what it stands for. There, there it exactly. is. Exactly. <laughs> Tell me about Abel 2219. Can you have a soft spot in your heart for a massive cluster of galaxies? Absolutely. You know, there are patches of sky that I, I feel quite proprietary about. And certainly this one, I'd recognise it if I saw a picture of it. And I'd, I'd say, oh, I know that one wavelengths and together that makes a very whitish light. It doesn't emit light at exactly the same amount at each wavelength, but overall it covers the whole spectrum. However, when we have an artificial source of light, we're not always going to get that full spectrum wavelength coverage. And here's a really extreme case of that. 